Hello, welcome to the Eating Disorder Hope online conference. We're thrilled to have you with us. And today's presentation is by Dr. Aaron Parks, and it is titled Using Neurobiology to Develop a Better Understanding and More Effective Treatments for Anorexia and Bulimia Nervosa. And Dr. Parks is here, and she is our um, honorary presenter. She is a clinical psychologist and neuroimaging researcher who is passionate about making scientific research accessible to everyone. Dr. Parks spent a decade using neuroimaging tools to study brain plasticity and development before she began specializing in the clinical training in eating disorder treatment. Dr. Parks graduated from Northwest University and UCSD SDSU's joint doctoral program in clinical psychology before completing her internship at UC San Francisco and then taking a postdoctoral fellowship at the UC San Diego Eating Disorder Center. Dr. Parks has served as a psychologist in their adolescent clinic and inpatient medical behavioral unit, also as a manager in their adult clinic and pediatric clinic, and as a co-lead in their world-renowned one-week intensive programs. Currently, she serves as the director of outreach and admissions and Dr. Parks combines her clinical expertise and research knowledge to help the public be better informed consumers of mental health services. And we are just about to start the presentation. I just wanted to give you a few housekeeping tips. If you are hoping for CE credit from this presentation, please be sure to attend the full one hour and also watch your chat box and we will be entering the link for the survey, a very brief survey that we need you to complete after the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you may enter these in the chat box. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Parks. Thank you, Jacqueline. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is a little new to me, so please do comment if you can't hear me or if I'm talking too fast. Dr. Walter Kay really wanted to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Kay, he is, I believe, now the most published researcher um, in eating disorders. He has over 400 peer-reviewed published articles, and he has been interested for decades in what the neurobiology of eating disorders uh, looks like. So he's been doing gene research, um, brain imaging research, lots of different research studies, and he really wanted to be here. He's bummed to miss it. He's actually at another conference right now. Uh, I am going to be using a combination of our slides, so bear with me. Um, please do ask questions along the way. Uh, just a quick, if people can all type in their chat box for me and let me know um, what your role is. Are you a advocate? Are you a family member of a patient? Are you in recovery? Are you a dietitian, a therapist, a researcher? Just will give me kind of an idea of um, who I'm speaking with today, since I can't see all of you smiling and nodding your heads. Are you seeing anything in the chat box, Jacqueline? All right, well, um, I'm not sure if I can see your guys' chats. Erin, so, I do yeah. see some comments, and they are that we have, it looks like the majority are clinicians, uh, and a couple of parents. Okay, sounds great. Um, and then Jacqueline, if there are questions, feel free to interrupt me during it. It looks like you'll be able to see the questions. Let me know. Thank you. So, thank you. So I will dive right in. Um, a lot of research to cover in a short amount of time. Let me make sure I've got the screen right. Um, so why are we talking about brains and neurobiology and eating disorder? And one of the reasons is that there's really a limited effic um, efficacy of current treatments. There aren't a lot of proven treatments that really reverse the core symptoms of people with anorexia and bulimia. And we still lack a mechanist, uh, mechanistic understanding of neurobiological contributions, and that's what we're trying to develop. So there are a lot of puzzling symptoms that occur in people with eating disorders and anorexia. Um, one is that it has to, a fairly consistent onset in adolescence and puberty. Um, it involves, for anorexia, severe restricted eating and eventually emaciation. There are body image distortions and fear of being fat. Um, people who struggle with anorexia tend to be anxious, risk avoidant, perfectionistic, obsessive. We aren't in, um, 
they have a very narrow range of symptoms compared to other behavioral health disorders. Uh, some things that are fairly specific, like oversensitive to mistakes and loss. Um, we talk to people who got an A minus on a test and it feels like the end of the world where there's other people who get an A minus to be proud of it or not think about it very much. They might also code things as mistakes that are in fact mistakes. Another thing that's different is there's a lot of people who struggle with eating disorders who either are not aware that they're ill um, or really resistant to the idea that they are ill. If you're depressed, a lot of people tend to want to stop being depressed. If you are struggling with schizophrenia, you want to stop having the symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, but for not all, but many people with eating disorders, they find the disorder to be egocentric, which means that there's part of the disorder that, that they relate to, that they aren't super eager to get rid of. Um, we also see relentless overexercise as a symptom, and there aren't any proven treatments that are reversing these core symptoms. We do have some treatments that help with weight restoration. We have some symptoms that help with body image, um, but some of these core symptoms, they end up staying the same throughout treatment. The other thing that's important to talk about is the course of this illness. So right now, only about 50 to 60% of people internationally, worldwide, um, have a full recovery from their eating disorder, and about 30% remain chronically ill, fluctuating between either partial recovery that they maintain forever or having full recovery and then relapse. And then finally, estimates vary from 5 to 10% of people with eating disorders die. This makes it have the highest mortality rate of any mental health illness. So the conventional notion of eating disorders is that they are psychosocial illnesses. And clearly eating and body image are important to most of us. Um, I also like to put up a picture of all of the diet books that were released in 2016. I did a Google, just diet books released in 2016, and there's about 100 diet books that were released. I'm like, how can we have that much to say about dieting that year after year, so many books come out about it? Um, but the truth is our culture has an appetite, there's a pun, has an appetite for dieting. And they guess that maybe 85% of people in America will diet, and yet only about 1% develop an eating disorder. So what else is going on? And we also have some proof that at least anorexia really predates the current culture. This is an excerpt um, from something written in 1689, uh, talking about a woman who neglected herself, not eating herself for two full years, and everyone was surprised by it. And this was a time when being thin wasn't fashionable. There's also some accounts in the literature of people who would fast for their religion as a way to show respect to their religion or their god. And similar to maybe what we're seeing today with anorexia, that if being X weight is ideal, then being X minus three pounds is even more ideal, that they were taking that same concept but with fasting for religion. So if fasting for two days to honor your God is good, then fasting for three days is even better. Um, so there were different cultural things that have compelled people to reduce their eating, but the disorder has always been there. Um, so again, just if we, if it were just culture, if it were just society, if it were just parenting, we would see a higher incidence of eating disorders. Um, but what we do want to know is, are there susceptibility factors that make some women more vulnerable to dieting and weight loss? So if most of the country will diet, what is it about people who develop eating disorders that when they start a diet, it turns into an eating disorder? So over the last couple of decades, um, there have been several new studies. So first are family studies, and we see that eating disorders run in families. And if you have an eating disorder, you're more likely than someone who's never had an eating disorder to have a family member um, who has struggled with it. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be the same eating disorder. So you may have anorexia, but your aunt will struggle with bulimia, and you may even have a family member who struggles with binge eating disorder. But that doesn't answer the question if it's learned or if it's like genetic or heritable. So there is a way to tease that apart, and that is with identical versus non-identical twin studies. Uh, this is very complicated research that figures out what the risk, the heritable risk of a symptom or an illness is. Um, and through several different research studies, they've concluded that there's approximately a 50 to 80 percent heritable risk. That is a very, very powerful uh, genetic contribution to eating disorders. That being said, it's not like we're finding individual genes that are passed from parent to offspring that are the anorexia gene or the bulimia gene. Rather, what we're seeing is that there are genes that may be related to pre-morbid behaviors. Um, what I mean by that is like temperament traits. And so you will have a parent with a certain temperament trait and that is actually encoded in their brain and that gets passed down to their offspring. 
So the most powerful takeaway, or I'm sorry, the most important takeaway is that there's powerful neurobiology that's contributing to the risk for eating disorders. So this is a look at the childhood premorbid traits. Uh, so long before someone develops an eating disorder, when we ask both them and their family members if they exhibited any of these traits, um, they said that they did long before the eating disorder came. So one is harm avoidant. So these are not risk to pe people who struggle with anorexia and to some extent people who struggle with bulimia. Um, even before they got ill, they were people who were not risk takers. Um, they were very sensitive to, this is reward sensitivity. You notice that that is not significant, but what they are sensitive to is consequences. So on the right hand side there, when they've got the traits and the p-value, what they're doing is they're comparing it to healthy controls. So in our population, there are people who've never had an eating disorder that are harm avoidant. There are people who've never had an eating disorder that um, have sleep problems. What we want to know is that in people who do have eating disorders, did they have a greater incidence of these um, different symptoms prior to developing their eating disorder? Um, so there was no difference with reward sensitivity, but they are significantly more harm avoidant, uh, struggling with social phobia and alexithymia which means that they have difficulty labeling their emotions or know how they're feeling. Um, these are people who in your office will say, I'm totally fine. And you'll notice that they have like little bumps on their arms and, um, and they're like, no, 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 I'm fine. There's nothing going on. And are those bumps maybe being caused by a stress reaction? I can't think of anything that I'm stressed out about. I ask, well, what's going on in your life? Well, I mean, my mom is in the hospital right now and I just started a new semester at college and I just broke up with my boyfriend and I'm taking an extra class. Like, okay, you do have things that you could be stressed out about. They just aren't as aware of the stress of the emotions that they're feeling. They also had increased interoceptive awareness. So interoceptive is a long fancy word for saying, I like to joke, it means knowing when you need to pee. It's basically receiving messages from your body, knowing when you are thirsty, knowing when you are hungry. Uh, when we talk with people who are struggling with eating disorders, they might talk about how all of their colleagues or all of their friends have gone to sleep, um, whereas they can keep studying through the fatigue or everybody had to take a study break to go get food and they can keep studying through the hunger. Uh, we also hear about this with athletes, athletes who can play and train through the pain. We also see increased food obsessions even before the eating disorder began, increased worry about the future, uh, which you'll hear we later call anticipatory anxiety and increased sleep problems. So all of these are existed in childhood before the eating disorder came, and we believe that this is what's getting passed down from parent to offspring. So going down the childhood traits menu, um, so perfectionism, wanting things to be a certain way, being very achievement oriented, and I'd also say goal oriented. Once they set their mind to something, it's like tunnel vision that they're going to achieve their goal and get what they set their mind to. Um, there can be obsessionality, so this could be wanting things to be symmetrical, wanting things to be exact, um, lining things up in a closet, knowing exactly where everything is on their desk. Uh, this Again, the sensitivity to criticism, punishment, and mistakes. We hear a lot from parents, they'll say, you know, I've never, I never had to get mad at him or her before because because they always do everything right. They, they try really hard not to do anything wrong. Um, and that's really driven by the sensitivity to criticism and punishment. This anticipatory anxiety, lots of what ifs, worrying what might be happening, um, planning for the future. If this happens, then I'll do this. If this happens, then I'll do this. Difficulty with uncertainty, novelty, change in social situations, really harm avoidant. Uh, being inflexible and rule bound. So the sometimes they're described as black and white thinkers. Once I've decided that things need to be this way, it's hard for me to change my mind that it has to be a different way. Um, it's hard for them when they break the rules, it's hard to see other people breaking the rules, very rule bound. Um, and also can be impulsive, overreactive, and emotional, which, which sounds maybe the opposite of some of the things that I named, but in fact, they all kind of weave together nicely. Now, there is not anyone that has 100% of these symptoms, and it's certainly possible that there could be some people who struggle with an eating disorder that have none of these symptoms. But what the research has found is that a lot of people with eating disorders have a lot of these symptoms, and that a lot of these uh, also existed in their parents. And forgive me, I'm forgetting if I have this on a future slide, but I want to say this more than once. These are not bad traits. Being sensitive to criticism and punishment isn't necessarily a bad trait. I mean, they tend to make really good students and good athletes and good colleagues. Um, being achievement oriented or even perfectionistic is not inherently a bad trait. So I just want us to remember that as we move forward in the talk. 
So what we want to find out is what is the link between these childhood traits that we're seeing in people with eating disorders and in their parents, and then also what's the link between that and developing the pathological eating. So the map on your right kind of, uh, I'll just kind of walk you through it. So starting at the top, you already have these traits. You're born, you're a little more anxious child than the average child. You're a little more obsessive. You're a little more rule following. And then puberty happens. And we think that there's something about puberty that's flipping the switch. Um, another clue that, one clue is that we're seeing a lot of onset around puberty. But another clue that there might be a hormonal switch is there are a few people, not a few, there are people that spontaneously remit when they're going through menopause. Another suggestion that there might be some sort of hormonal switch that's turning something on and off. So while going through puberty, we got um, hormonal changes, the stress that comes with going through puberty, some cultural, obvious cultural factors, but also brain development changes. And so you mix that up with those pre-existing traits and you see an increase in dysphoria and anxiety. That leads to dieting. Um, and if you already are susceptible to being perfectionistic and obsessive and rule bound, um, this additional success at dieting, success, I'm gonna put in quote marks, um, and finding that dieting actually decreases those negative emotions of dysphoria and anxiety. And you have weight loss, and it just kind of circles back and forth, around and around in a vicious cycle. So let me make one other point here. It is very difficult for most people to starve themselves and lose weight. So on the left-hand side is a fairly typical dietary study that they did in obese women. And the study compared behavioral therapy to diet alone to a combination of behavioral therapy and diet. And you'll see that the... The combined therapy is that green line, and that resulted at the end of treatment in the most weight loss. So everyone in the study lost weight. But when you look at the one-year follow-up, everyone started gaining the weight back in that first year. And at five-year follow-up, everyone was back to where they started and really averaging a little bit higher than where they started. Uh, what you see is that recidivism rates and obesity is very high, and it really echoes what all of us know, that diets don't really work. But if you look at the graph on the right, we're seeing what weight loss looks like in people with anorexia. And so what's different about people in anorexia is that this is a, a group of people that can eat relatively small amounts of food every day for many years and basically starve themselves to death. So there are powerful homeostatic mechanisms in the brain that make it very difficult for most people to not eat. So just like if you tried right now to hold your breath until you died, you wouldn't be able to do that. Your body will just override whatever your cognition is trying to make you do, and you will take a breath and you will live. Um, if you intentionally deprive yourself of water, you will develop a very powerful thirst and you will get compelled towards water. Um, so there's similar kinds of mechanisms for food that kick in and drive eating behavior. This is why people who talk about doing crash diets, severely limiting their calories, end up then breaking their diet and having a binge. So the question we've been really curious about is why, in people with anorexia, why don't these homeostatic mechanisms kick in and drive eating behavior? So what is different about eating behaviors and eating disorders? Okay, so think about what it's like when you get hungry. In my family, we call it hungry grumpy or hangry. Usually when you get hungry, it causes most people to get a little bit grumpy and irritable. And they get pleasure or reward when they're eating. And if you get hungry enough, food becomes even more pleasurable and rewarding. I'm not sure if any of you have ever gone grocery shopping when you're hungry, um, but it reduces inhibition. Just the act of being hungry makes you more likely to take risks, to gamble, to do drugs, and to buy extra things at the grocery store that you wouldn't normally buy because rewards are extra rewarding when you are hungry. But that's not what we're seeing in anorexia. Um, we see the opposite, in fact, that being hungry actually reduces their anxiety. I sometimes think about it like similar to before you give a big talk. You know that you're going to be giving a talk for 400 people and you're about to go on stage and someone hands you a pastry. You might be like, uh, not right now, I'll have it when I'm done. Because before you give a talk, your stomach is kind of in knots and actually not eating might relax your stomach a little bit. Uh, so that's a very slight comparison. I know that anorexia is on a much bigger scale than that. Um, so, the, as I am talking about neurobiology today, I also want to weave in how we talk about this with families. We talk about neurobiology with our families here at UC San Diego all the time. We talk about it during the assessment stage. We talk about it during orientation. We have neurobio groups for the families. We have neurobio groups for the patients. Um, it's really important to remind people that people who are struggling with eating disorders are having a different, not just emotional, but physiological response to food and eating 
than the average person. Uh, we tell, when we talk with family members about it, it usually helps them reduce some of their blame towards um, or their feelings of frustration towards their family member who is struggling with eating when they realize that like, okay, just because food is pleasurable for me to eat, I'm recognizing that it's, it's the opposite for you, that it actually makes you feel better to not eat. And it's helpful to them to see that there's lots and lots of data behind this. Um, fa uh, Family-based therapy, which we use in, we offer it to all of our families who have young adults all the way down to about six or seven years of age that we treat in our clinic and for people who, um, I'd say the majority at least, uh, try FBT to start with. And that will initially kind of magnify the struggle to eat when you're making the parents and the kids sit down and eat together. Um, but it will work in the long run and having the parents have this increased empathy for their child really helps with those family meals. Okay, so the way that we've understood behaviors up to now are not really talking about how the brain works, but rather psychiatry has been describing a cluster of symptoms. Um, we've been talking about you know, the different symptoms, like a depressed person feels sad and feels guilt and doesn't get pleasure in things they used to and maybe sleeps more or less. So we're talking about symptoms as opposed to the actual um, encoding of depression in the brain. And they, we've been making improvements in psychology um, and it's still challenging. There's not a brain center for anorexia. Uh, but as we have new understanding and new language for how behavior is coded in the brain, we can start to think about how do these circuits function in eating disorders. And ultimately, since behavior is wired into molecules in the brain, how exactly can we then wire, the, wire new behaviors into those molecules? How, ultimately, how can we develop better treatments? So let's first talk about whether people with eating disorders have an alteration in the brain of the symptoms associated with food and weight regulation. So where in the brain and body might this occur? So first you get metabolic signals from the gut. So this is kind of, if you look at the bottom of the slide there, we got the gut drawn out. So you get metabolic signals from the gut and the endocrine tissue that go up to the brain and communicate about where you're at with digestion and how hungry you are. Um, and a lot of these messages go up to the hypothalamus. That's a part of the brain that's very important for energy balance. It informs you about the energy stores in your body. Um, it tells the brain about sugars and fat and what's needed. Um, but we've been really interested in also higher brain circuits. And up until recently, we haven't had a good method of really looking inside the brain at people that are alive and functioning. We've been looking at the hypothalamus in animal studies. Um, we're looking at it when somebody has an injury. Um, but how can we look at the rest of the cortex? But so now we are able to look at brain, um, brain circuits, not with a biopsy, getting, getting under the skull. We can do this safely using fMRI. And let me just, I'm going to describe fMRI a little bit on the next page, but one of the things that we're looking at is the limbic system and the frontal lobes. So let me advance this slide. Um, so we've got the gut sending information about an energy balance up to the brain. But then we also have um, the limbic system and the frontal lobes that drive the pleasure and the motivation to eat. And the frontal lobes are also in charge of cognitive control and inhibition. So helping you to do something and also helping you to not do something. I'm, I don't know if anyone's ever been in a place where you're not supposed to like, you're supposed to be quiet. Like maybe you're sitting in church and you just, your brain's like, wouldn't it be weird if I just yelled something right now? And you don't actually do that, but your brain can have the idea and you could have that behavior, but your brain inhibits you from doing that. Um, but so these high, higher cortical centers for driving and regulating appetite and behavior are also the same systems for mood and self-control. So this limbic system is regulating mood and self-control while also driving and regulating appetite behavior. So what's going on with that? Um, what we think is happening is there's this imbalance in reward and inhibition and in that there's either too little or too much reward and or too much or too little inhibition. And this is something that we can test and measure in these brain circuits. So in the limbic circuit, they're evaluating the reward. Is this valuable to me? Do I want the reward? Um, is the reward meaningful to me? That salience processing and then generating responses to go and get that reward. The cognitive control circuit, and it's important to keep in mind that these are two separate circuits here, um, are doing conflict monitoring. So let's say um, something relevant to teenagers. Maybe the, the reward you want to go do is you want to go talk to that person that you have a crush on. You want to go ask how their math test went. 
Um, so your limbic circuit is thinking about the reward and evaluating it that like it might feel good to get the attention, it might feel good to talk to him, but then the other part is doing conflict monitoring. What if he, he or she says this and is making a decision about the pros and cons of whether or not you should go and get that reward. And lastly, the cognitive control circuit is also responsible for inhibiting whether or not you go and do something that you want to do. So you might see a reward and your cognitive control circuit's like, no, you're not going to pursue that reward. An example for me, my um, children woke me up at 3.30 in the morning. And so my limbic circuit, my reward valuation was thinking about the reward of staying in bed. But my cognitive control circuit inhibited that desire to get the reward of staying in bed a couple extra hours so that I made sure that I was at work at time so I could give this talk to you guys. So is pathological eating related to altered modulation of reward and inhibition in anorexia? The things that appeal to those teens, just to be kind of trite, food, sex, drugs, rock and roll, um, but also material things, they seem to appeal less to people with anorexia. And many of you can relate to this um, for the parents in the audience. I've had several parents say things to me like, I offered my child a car if they would just recover, from, you know, if they just gained 15 pounds. And they're 17. What 17 year old doesn't want a car? And we hear a lot of that, that rewards just aren't salient to people who are struggling with eating disorders. And I, I was even talking with someone last night who was saying that they were trying to come up with a Hanukkah present for their um, son who was struggling. And they said that his brother and his sister had come up with these long list of Hanukkah presents and he can't think of a single thing that he wants. So rewards are just not as salient. And we're seeing this also when we test this. So in addition to seeing that they underconsume food, drugs, and money, that they don't have reward sensitivity, we also ask them things like, you could have $10 today, or I can mail you $12 in a year. Now, almost everybody would take the $10 now, but people who have a um, altered functioning in their limbic system where rewards aren't as salient will actually choose the delayed gratification of $12 six months from now or $12 in a year. And when we do imaging studies, we see this under response to receiving rewards and an over response to uh, anticipation of what might happen next. And the inefficient and anxiety circuit, we see this high punishment sensitivity, being very harm avoidant and very concerned with the consequences. We have a gambling study that we do in the scanner where we give people $20 and we ask them to try and win as much money as they possibly can while they're in the scanner. So a scanner, it's like imagine a long tube and you're laying down in it. We're able to take pictures of the brain while you're doing different tasks. So they can kind of have, uh, think of like a video game controller while they're lying in there. And most people will try to win as much money as possible. And when they do win money, every time their, their bank amount goes up on the screen, they can see themselves gambling and winning money. Um, their reward center gets excited. What we're actually seeing is the opposite, that the idea of losing that initial $20 um, is very scary. That's where we're seeing all of the activation, that they're very afraid of the consequence more than they are uh, moved by the reward. So hunger normally enhances the value of food and it motivates us to eat. So since we're talking about the reward system, let's talk about how food is rewarding. Um, food is rewarding because of the taste. People enjoy the taste of food. P food is rewarding because when you are hungry, it satiates you. And, and food is also rewarding for some people because of the social aspects of food. And when you are hungry, um, it activates regions associated with reward and it will reduce inhibitory self-control. Perhaps you are sitting in an in-person lecture conference and you get really thirsty. And you might be like, oh, I don't want to be rude, though, and get up during the talk and go get water. So you're, you're inhibiting that. But at some point, it's go, um, the need to get water is going to activate your reward circuitry such that the, in, um, you're going to have less inhibition and be more willing to stand up and go get that drink of water because you become more and more thirsty. Uh, so it activates regions associated with reward, reduces top-down cognitive inhibit inhibitory control. So like I said before, when you're hungry, humans are less, healthy humans are less risk averse. We're more likely to, we do a better job gambling, uh, not better job, we're more likely to gamble, more likely to do drugs, more likely to buy foods we wouldn't buy um, when we are hungry. It also increases our sensitivity to them. Um, when animals are hungry, they use more drugs. 
again, shopping leads to purchases of, I, you know, we believe that all food is good food. What people often categorize as unhealthy, higher calorie food is what they're more likely to buy when they are hungry, as all of our parents maybe told us. Um, so what we're wondering is do people who struggle with anorexia have an abnormal response to hunger? So this is the neural pathway that transmits taste signals into valuation of food and motivation to eat. So non we first were studying this through non-human primates and they showed that signals are transmitted from the sweet taste receptors in the tongue. So you have sugar, they bind with the sweet receptor, um, they, they fit into it in your tongue. And then that sends a message to the brainstem and the thalamus um, and to the gustatory cortex and the insula. So the insula will then integrate that information with motivation and homeostatic drives um, to guide motivated behavior. So maybe to eat more of that. Um, the anterior insula is interconnected with the amygdala, which is important in extracting salience of specific food, tastes, and textures. So both the amygdala and the anterior insula project along the ventromedial axis of the striatum in a converging fashion to mediate and regulate the consumption of palatable food. Um, this is all to say that you have multiple areas of your brain working together in conjunction to be motivated to have food, to go and consume the food. Um, the orbital frontal cortex also encodes the subjective value of food reward. These are the cognitions or the thoughts that you put to it. And this entire circuit is really interconnected and it transforms taste signals, the taste of sugar, into the valuation of food that is good and the motivational to eat. I'm going to eat more of that when hungry. I'm sorry, I should have been clicking this while I was talking so you knew about the different areas that I was talking about while I went. I forgot that I activated that slide. Okay, so fMRI. Um, so we did exactly that, what we, what we described. We wanted to know, is food tasting different to people with eating disorders? Is, like at what point in that circuitry that I just described are we seeing a breakdown? Is all of it not working or just some of it? Um, so really quickly with fMRI, this is a non-invasive way to look inside the brain. So people lie in the scanner and it uses a magnet to um, look at what's going on. And what it does so think about it like if you're lifting weights and you're using certain muscles, the muscles that are working the hardest are going to be um, using up oxygen and glucose. Um, they're going to be, they need energy in order to function, they're going to consume more energy. And we believe the same is true in the brain. So the part of the brain that you're using for a specific task, we would expect to see increased blood flow to that area of the brain. And then also that the oxygen would be taken out of that blood um, in order to energize or fuel that part of the brain that's being used for a task. So what the word that you hear is that we're looking at the ratio of hemoglobin to de oxygenated hemoglobin to deoxygenated hemoglobin. So that's what happens. So that's why we're able to lay people in the scanner, have them do a bunch of things, and then see how, what areas of the brain are using more energy. So in this study here, we had people have a taste of sugar water. So while they're lying in the scanner, they had a straw. And the sugar water, in my opinion, kind of tastes like watered down kool -Aid. So this isn't like the best tasting sugar water, but it's definitely sugar water. And we measured activity. And this study has been replicated numerous times at different institutes um, and different scanners with different subjects. And we keep getting the same results again and again and again. Um, and that is that people who have recovered from anorexia had less activation in their insula, caudate, and putamen, aka this reward center we were talking about, for, um, for sugar or water compared to the people who had never struggled with an eating disorder. And this study has been done a couple different ways. Um, we would have them have a small breakfast before they did the fMRI study. We've also done things where they have like a larger breakfast. We've had fasting where they, I think, couldn't eat after 6 p.m. at night and we scan them the next morning. Um, for healthy controls, when you've had 16 hours of not eating, you get really excited when you get the sugar water because your reward center um, is, is really propelling you, motivating you to go for the reward of, of food and um, to satiate that hunger. Uh, but again, even in the recovered ANs, even after a period of fasting, um, we still saw reduced activation in the insula cotton. So there's something about the reward or approach of food that's altered in people, even when you've been recovered from anorexia. And some people in our study think have been recovered 10 or 15 years. So this could explain why they are able to eat a very small amount. It's because food isn't rewarding. So remember when we looked back in those obesity studies, it was incredibly hard to sustain a diet for a long amount of time, but that's because they had 
the typical reward circuitry where food is still rewarding even if they're depriving themselves of that reward. And remember, the hungrier and hungrier you get, the more and more rewarding food is. So the next question is, can they taste sweetness and know that they are hungry? And it turns out, yes, they can. They can taste the sweetness. They do have sweetness receptors. It binds. They can tell the difference between different types of taste. We can check out like bitter versus sweet versus salty. So that first part in circuitry is working. Um, they, we talked about before about how they are not bothered by hunger cues, um, but research is suggesting that they do know when they're hungry. It just doesn't produce negative consequences for them as it does in more of a typically wired person. Um, so the problem is not with tasting the sweetness or knowing you're hungry. The problem is with the signal not being translated into leading mo motivation to carry out pursuit of a reward. So part of the circuit's working okay and part of it seems to not be working as well. So how is this related to pre-meal anxiety? Um, so we got a couple different things going on here. So we were looking at how people, I'm sorry, this kind of, I'm confused by where, where I put this graph or I put the graph. Um, okay, so if you look on the far white graph, we're looking what anxiety looks like over time. So it's, you'll see on the bottom, each little mark is 15 minutes. Um, and that people have increased anxiety before a meal, whereas most people when they're hungry have reduced anxiety because they're excited about going to eat the meal because, it's an, because it is rewarding. Okay. Um, oh, the next thing I want to talk about is going on. What's going on with dopamine level? Dopamine levels. So, in this, um, what we are seeing here. Sorry, taking me a moment. So, in the striatum circuit. Um, okay, let me get this up. So, in the fMRI, there was a response to winning or losing money, as I described described before and that people with anorexia had increased anxiety and were concerned with not losing the money. But what was interesting is that we also saw in both animal models um, and in our studies this, uh, that they have, the more anxious or harm avoidant you are, the more binding that you have to the D2 receptor. So dopamine is important for reward, is the transmitter, neurotransmitter that's important for reward and motivation. And since dopamine levels in the brain in response to the D2 receptor are different, this might give us a clue of why we're seeing um, this different circuitry or this different response to the circuitry. So the more anxious and harm avoidant you are, the more binding you have at the D2 receptor. Uh, another reason that this is important is the way in which we learn as humans and animals as well is you learn from reward and punishment. That's a critical part of life. If something is pleasant, you keep doing it. If something is aversive, you stop doing it. Um, parents of young kids know that we also taught, well, I guess older kids as well, that any attention could be positive. So for instance, when some people stop attending to negative behaviors because that attention was positive and so you do more of it. Um, what this suggests with this increased binding at the D2 receptor is that it's harder for people um, to learn behaviors, to learn from their mistakes, to learn from reward, and to learn from punishment. So whereas in the long run, we are pointing out to people the ways in which maybe their eating disorder isn't working for them, they're not, they're not learning that these behaviors are in fact diverse. Okay, so this is one of my favorite slides, like checking the time, I want to make sure we have time for questions, um, to kind of finally illustrate and bring together all the things we're talking about. So one of the most important parts is that you realize there's two different circuitries. There's circuitry to approach things, and there's circuitry to inhibit things. So our brain's going to motivate us to do all sorts of things. It got us out of bed this morning. It got us to turn in the computer and log in um, instead of staring at our phone and watching Instagram. Like we, It helps motivate us and move us. And then inhibition is also sometimes what keeps us off Instagram and finishing the work that we have to do. It, it prevents us from maybe sitting down and watching TV and instead we wash the dishes. Um, so we tend to think of reward as an on and off phenomenon and just it's good to remember that it's more complicated than that, that they're actually opposing circuits that activate and inhibit responses to reward. So let's be, let's, let's be a bunny for a second. Um, it's very safe for a rabbit to be in their little den. And if they had no motivation for rewards, they could sit on their little bunny butt in their rabbit hole um, forever. It's safe there, it's warm, maybe they have a bunny friend in there. 
but eventually that rabbit's going to get hungry and that hunger, that message from the gut is going to activate the reward center and motivate them to go and seek food. Now, if while they're out looking for food, they run into a fox, they shouldn't be like, hey fox, you know, my motivation center's firing, my reward center's firing, I'm gonna keep with my behavior to go get the carrot. No, that reward center is going to stop and their inhibition circuitry is gonna start firing and they're going to run away from the fox. And for a rabbit, and even for our ancestors, think like the early, early humans, food was really risky. So even though you may be very hungry and very motivated to eat, you need to have a system to inhibit that motivation or inhibit that hunger in a risky situation. Um, the rabbits do that really well. They, if, if rabbits do a good job of staying in the hole when the fox is out, um, they stay alive and they pass their genes on to their offspring. Uh, Dr. K likes to remind us that nature doesn't care if you're happy, nature just wants to see your genes get passed down. Um, same thing if you think about all of those temperament traits that we talked about before. If you're part of the early humans and you guys are hunters and gatherers and everyone's sleeping by the fire but the anxious one among you wakes up every time you hear a noise, is that a, is that a predator, an animal that's, that could eat us as we're sleeping by the campfire? Um, that's an important person to have around when you find new berries while you're hunting, hunting and gathering, I guess the gathering part of that. Um, if you say like, hey, let's first feed it to the squirrel and see if the squirrel dies before you eat it to see if, to, or to test it to see if it's poisonous. Those are the people who stayed alive. The anxious people stayed alive and passed their genes along. Um, so animals and people, especially back then, had signals about that food could be risky. And maybe what's happening in people who are struggling with eating disorders is that that is just a, a very a very loud and kind of um, the volume is really turned up on that circuitry that the brain is telling them still that something is risky about food and that food is not rewarding. Okay, a couple more minutes. Um, so anorexia and eating behavior. So we see that they can just kind of summarize where we're at. They can sense being hungry, sometimes even obsessed with food, but aren't able to translate that into initiation and motivation to eat. Um, so what is going on with initiating motivation? Why is that not happening? And does the anxiety or inhibition or inflexi inflexibility override the influence of hunger? So why is the hunger not working? What is overriding it? Um, we are seeing that in anorexia, people are more sensitive to punishment, as we talked about, um, likely miscoding food as risky, and it may involve the striatal or amygdala pathways as well. Uh, sorry, it looks like I already said some of this, so what's the benefit? And our ancestors lived in a dangerous world, so these traits were like an alarm. Um, it was better to be biased towards knowing when something was risky than knowing when something was rewarding. And this might go hand in hand with the anticipatory anxiety that we see, this what if repertoire of making alternate plans, worrying about the future. Um, so when we, so why are we doing this? Why do we care about how these traits are wired in the brain? Well, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, hopefully we can come up with some more targeted treatment, um, pharmacological treatment, but also we found that just knowing that this is how your brain is wired and how your brain is coded, that really we can't take away some of these temperament traits, it alleviates some of the blame and the guilt and allows people to figure out, okay, well, how can I use these traits towards recovery now? And remember, these are really a lot, these are really great traits. It gives people who recover a competitive advantage in lots of different professions. Um, we talked about the high error detection rate. That is great for research. That's great for a tax accountant. Um, we talked about how they have a high attention to detail. Um, that's great for all sorts of professions, for being a student. But I also think friends who have a high attention to detail give the best gifts. I mean, these are really good traits. And in our experience, you know, we have hundreds of people with us a year, and really people with eating disorders are some of just the most incredible people. Um, they do go on to do wonderful things with these traits that they have, with this drive that they have. And what we hope to do is take, you kind of think of it like a, um, a lighthouse beam, and if you have all of these traits focused on your body, so if you have a high attention to detail, but you're looking at your body, and a high error detection rate, and you're looking for every error in your body, and you're achievement oriented, but what you're trying to achieve is a certain number on a scale, you can see how all these traits are they're being used for, for bad, for evil, for non-productive things. 
Um, so they're being used destructively, that's what I was looking for. So since these traits don't go away, how can we help people to use them constructively towards their relationships, careers, professions, et cetera? Um, so trait treatment strategies. So one trait treatment strategy goes along with uh, family-based therapy, also called the Maudsley Method. Um, within it, we give a lot of psychoeducation to the parents and the patient about the neurobiology of eating disorders, helping them understand that eating is difficult. We make a lot of comparisons with the cancer metaphor. So for instance, if your child was getting treatment for cancer, chemotherapy, that hurts, stinks, um, you wouldn't sit and say to them, just do it. You'd like rub their back and try to distract them. Um, same is true with an eating disorder. Eating is really hard as we've just kind of covered in the previous 30 slides. Um, so what we would treat, the, we help the parents to treat the children the same way you treat anything else that's really hard. Like how can I help you? How can I distract you from the parts of this that are hard so you can get through it? And in life, all of us do things that we don't want to do. Um, so we spend less time focused on want, helping them to want to eat and more helping them on how can you do it and be successful with it. Um, because all the research suggests that like maybe especially during early recovery, you're, that drive is, that motivation to eat is not going to be there. So there's no use spending hours and hours and hours talking about how to get someone to want to eat. Rather, how can you do something that is hard that you don't want to do. Uh, we can modify the environment and interactions. So since we know that there's a very high anticipatory anxiety, we remove that. Um, we know that there's difficulty set shifting, so uh, we shift set for them. Um, we have a very, very structured environment and encourage people in their homes to set up a very structured environment. We always have dinner at this time. We always have lunch at this time. Uh, this is exactly what you're eating for dinner and you're gonna eat 100% of it. Um, and while at first it's like, whoa, that sounds so much worse. I wanna, I wanna have some say or control over it. In fact, what most patients tell us and tell us pretty quickly is that their anxiety starts going down because they don't have to play the what if game. They already know exactly what's going to happen. Not like, oh, well, my mom asked me to eat this later. Well, my dad asked me to eat this later. Are we gonna have a fight about whether or not I can sub this for this? They have just a very, um, what, a very well-defined structured environment. Um, medication is another thing that we've found that works to help with some of the traits um, or to mediate them. Okay, let's see here. I think we're kind of nearing the 10 minute left mark. So before I go into more slides, which I have, I want to see if there are any questions and then I can also tailor the remainder of the talk towards those questions. Thanks, Erin. It's been fascinating. And we do have a few questions. Um, the first was, what are your views on medication incorporated in treatment? Um, what are my views on medications incorporated in treatment? Um, I would, I, to, if you want one word, it's positive. Uh, not everybody who comes to our center ends up taking medication. Um, but I really liken it to, I talked about this with a patient recently, um, if you broke your arm, technically, if you were really, 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 really careful, you could hold your arm perfectly steady for eight weeks while your bone reset. You don't need to have a cast. You don't need to have a sling, but it sure would make it helpful. And then even after your bone is done resetting, physical therapy is going to help it heal even more. That's kind of how I feel about medication is that if it can... Um, reduce the anxiety a little bit such that you can use your skills, um, if it can help you access learning. So a big part of therapy is not just getting through it, it's rather learning lots and lots of skills. Uh, DBT is our foundation here, Dialectic Behavioral Therapy, um, and people probably walk away, with, we probably teach 40 or 50 skills. There's a lot of skills that get taught. No way to all those skills work for everyone. We want everyone to find like six or seven to really fill their toolbox with. And in order to develop skills and learn them and get good at them and practice and practice and practice, you have to be able to learn. So if we can give any medications that help improve um, learning by maybe reducing the anxiety, then I think it's a good thing too. Um, there are, there's a lot of stigma with taking um, medications for mental illness, which I really hope we start thinking of as brain illness, but really not that stigma for taking it for diabetes or heart disease. Um, so your brain is a part of the body just like your heart is and your liver is. And so my hope is the more and more we start thinking about mental illness as brain illness, we're going to see um, some of the barriers to people trying out medications change. 
Interesting. Thank you. Uh, another question is, has the sugar water study or anything like it with the reward center been done with BED or bulimia? And it says, I'm curious whether eating is experienced as more rewarding than typical. That is a really great question. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge how anorexia heavy the first part of this talk was. I apologize for that. Um, so first, yes. And second, one of the things we found is that food is less rewarding for people who are struggling with binging. Um, and it could even be that like you continue to pursue the food hoping it would become rewarding. Uh, but we see that um, that the food isn't necessarily more rewarding. We do see that the reward center of the brain does fire differently with, um, with drugs in people who struggle with all sorts of thinking about it kind of like general dysregulation. So if you're having a hard time with your emotions, there's a lot of things that can make you feel better. And if I want to take just kind of like one little step back, I like to think about emotions on like the one to 10 scale, 10 being a really loud volume, one being really quiet. And we all have the same emotions, um, but the volume with which we hear it varies and the length at which it stays at that volume varies. So I like to think that like, oh, like kids laughing is a pleasant sound. Uh, except for when it's like super loud and lasts for two hours, right? So any emotion can be pleasant or unpleasant in this, this situation. But think about a time that you felt 10 out of 10 angry or 10 out of 10 guilty or 10 out of 10 sad. Um, when I'm at a 10 out of 10, I'm not functioning. So like if I'm angry at a family member, my husband, let's say for an example, if I'm 7 out of 10 angry at him, I can still go to a meeting. Like I can sit and talk to Dr. K. I'll be fine. But I'm like 9 out of 10, I'm not functioning very well, right? And so if you get stuck at a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 for a really long time, and that's what we're hearing with people with anorexia, but also in bulimia and binge eating disorder, you will do anything to escape that. Um, so binging and purging drops people pretty quickly down to like a 0 or a 1. Cutting, self-harming drops people really quickly to a 0 or a 1. Substance use, tantrums, there's lots of different things that you can do that work temporarily. So what we're thinking might be happening with bulimia and the binge eating disorder um, and, you know, we'd love to maybe in the future do a whole other talk really just focused on the neurobiology of binging, and we still have a lot more to learn, um, is that it might be a drive to reduce the emotions more than a drive for the reward of the food, if that makes sense. That is absolutely fascinating. So that emotional hijacking we sometimes see with clients is really defined by what you were saying. Another question, I am dealing with a client that lives alone and has little to no support system. She says that even if she was medicated and feeling good about things, she would most likely continue her bulimia pattern. I can see this being very hard for someone who lives alone. Thoughts? Yes, that sounds incredibly hard. Um, there's a lot of things that are hard about living alone and being isolated, even if you don't have an eating disorder. Um, and I'm not sure, it sounds like she's very under-resourced with regards to a support system. I'm not sure if she's under-resourced in other ways as well, like, you know, transportation, ability to make supports. Um, I mean, it, it's a really tough situation. I think it kind of goes back to why this research is so important. Um, one of the things that kind of advanced slides, some questions about, like, what we want more research on, and the reason for doing it is we strong, let's see here, uh, wow, I had a lot of slides. Um, proposing research. There is a lot that we don't know and this is a woman who it's not that she has failed treatment, treatment has failed her and I strong, we all here at San Diego strongly believe that about the 30% of people who have a chronic course and the 10% of people who die um, it really bothers us when people say things like well they're not motivated for treatment or they weren't able to engage with treatment um, well, no, the treatment has, has failed them, um, and we would see better recovery numbers if we'd had better treatment. So this is why we really want to figure out the neurobiology of what's going on. So for your client there, you know, perhaps um, the reward circuitry is so under-firing, underdeveloped, um, that, and then also you have to think about time, right? So we learn things. I like to think about it, I'm from Minnesota, so I like to think about it with snow, but you could do the same thing with grass. You know how people are walking on sidewalks and then they cut the corner and then after a while like a path gets worn in the grass where it's just dirt? Well that's exactly what's happening in your brain. So when you associate 
food with fear or you associate leaving your house with being embarrassed and then you do it again and again and again and again and again you're just really you're really laying down the foundation you're really creating a new wiring in your brain that reinforces the wiring that you're already born with um, so it can be an uphill battle for a lot of these patients especially if they've been ill for a long period of time um, so I'm wondering with her that it's not just food that's not rewarding um, but going out and socializing being around people uh, she says something that she has a really hard time with. As far as next steps, um, I'm sure this is probably what you're already doing with her, just motivational interviewing to get her to take the next step. What is the next right step for her? So that might be getting involved in some group therapy to start having social interactions and dealing with whatever social anxiety is getting in the way with her participating in more treatment. Um, motivational interviewing to get her to a doctor's office to talk about medications. There's a lot of great developments that are happening in medicine right now. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention, and I might not find the slide, but I'll just keep going forward with it, um, is, here we go, clear rules. And ex um, so people who struggle with eating disorders are just really good at ruminating. You can sit and have a five hour conversation with them about whether or not you should eat a cupcake from your local grocery store. Like they can just, they can stay on that same topic for a really, really long time. And that's what we're talking about when we say that you're having trouble shifting set. And so one of the things that we do for them is we will shift the set for them. So they want to talk about the Vons cupcake. I'll say, oh, Vons is the grocery store like around here. Um, I'll say, okay, well, we're done talking about the cupcake. It's time to eat it. And I just will not engage in the conversation. They are not capable of ending that conversation. I just won't engage in it with them. Um, and we also find the same thing that on the one hand, if they're perfectionistic and black and white, we want to introduce them to the gray of the world. And you can also play to that black and white. Like, nope, you can't do that. This is the rule. Um, so I'm not sure if that's true of your client, but we have found that really, really direct, strong rules and boundaries like, I really enjoy talking to you weekly and I'm not going to talk to you again until it is at the you know admissions office of this center. I'll be there and that is the next time we can talk or something like that. So kind of using their difficulty with shifting set to just shift set for them, to move them forward. We call it, um, looking for the slide, we call it pushing the needle, moving the needle for them so that they can advance the needle. Thank you, Erin. This is just absolutely fascinating. I know there are so many more questions that we will be forwarding to you after this. Um, it, just to wrap up the presentation, I want to remind everyone to please go into the chat box and click on that link. If they, if you are desiring CE credits, you had to have been here for attendance for the majority of the hour and completing that survey, and we will get that certificate to you at Eating Disorder Hope. And then, um, there are a few handouts. Uh, Dr. Parks has graciously provided a PDF of this presentation, and there's also some other materials there. And we have a few more minutes, Dr. Parks, if you just want to go over any remaining details that you think would be really helpful for people to know. Yeah, I would love to show you guys this um, look at the variability in weight gain. So you guys might have all experienced this, that you have some patients who are trying, uh, patients who are trying to restore weight and they're eating a lot and yet eating a lot, that's a judgmental term, but they're eating more than they ever have before and they're still not gaining weight. So just a couple quick things that we're finding out about biology. So first here is this is the variability in weight gain in response to overfeeding. So they took healthy sedentary volunteers and they had all of them eat an extra a thousand calories per day. And if you look on the right hand side, the eighth week of eating an extra thousand calories a day, one person gained one kilogram in eight weeks from eating an extra thousand calories a day. And then someone else gained seven kilograms, so, you know, 15 pounds by eating an extra thousand calories per day. That is a huge variability. And it's a good reminder to us that it's not as simple as like one calorie in, one calorie out, or X number of calories equals a pound. People are actually very variable in how many calories they need to gain a pound. But then on top of that, this is weight gain in an individual with anorexia. So the, the squares that are the light blue color are the number of calories that they're consuming. And then the dark green is their weight going up. So you'll notice that like every couple weeks, we have to add more calories in order for them to stay at the same slope of weight gain. And this is 
both baffling and super frustrating for parents and patients alike that like, okay, I'm eating 3,000 calories a day and I'm getting one pound a week and then all of a sudden 3,000 calories a day doesn't do anything for them. So then they have to eat 3,500 calories a day to gain one pound a week. So, um, and you notice that it's not until the very end that they can return to this, you know, more typical amount of calories. Um, and then lastly, and so here's just a kind of a comparison of daily caloric requirements. So you can see that even after recovery, um, people need more calories per day to maintain their weight than a uh, healthy control would. Um, and it isn't, you know, until a while after recovery that it starts getting more normal. So it's just kind of something to think about when and why we want to do more research with biology is so that we can give pa uh, patients and parents kind of an idea of what to expect and what's going on with their body. We do not know why people who struggle with eating disorders use calories inefficiently while they're recovering, um, but it's something that's good to remember and especially good for parents to hear that they are inefficient with the calories, so we have to make sure that the calories we're giving them are dense um, and that, that the parents are, and the patients are just kind of kind to themselves. It is hard to eat 4,000 calories a day if you don't have an eating disorder. It's especially hard if you mentally don't want to eat and physically don't want to eat. So. Thank you. This was excellent. Um, it, how can folks get in touch with you regarding research, treatment, um, or any if they are interested in having you as a speaker? Okay, yeah. So um, you can email me directly. My email address is E as in Aaron, and my last name Parks, P A R K S at ucsd.edu, which is UC San Diego. Um, we have a lot of things going on at our center. So we are both a training program, a treatment program, and a research program. And all three of those work together synergistically. So uh, for trainings, we offer um, about one conference every 18 months. Uh, usually about 300 clinicians attend. And then we do like three or four smaller workshops throughout the year. So like Dr. Yvonne Eisler comes over from London um, and joins our team, or we've had Dr. Daniel LaGrange come down from San Francisco, uh, Laura Hill comes out from Ohio, and we do kind of more intimate, like 35 person workshops for specific aspects, specific treatments people want to learn. And that's usually like one to two days in length. Um, so that's our training program. Anyone local in San Diego, we do uh, free CE seminars every other Tuesday. And then our treatment program, we have a pediatric program for kids as young as six, um, a teen program, an adult program. And then because we are, a, you know, a large nonprofit university, we're able to kind of do it in a community college model. So at any given time, there's probably eight or nine groups happening here. So we're able to have a trauma track and a substance use track and able to treat things at the same time. Because our ultimate goal is for people to go build a life worth living. And you can't do that if you're always in treatment. So we don't want them coming to treatment here for eating disorder and then going somewhere else for trauma treatment, somewhere else for substance use treatment. You're going to spend your whole life in treatment. So we treat everything at the same time. Um, and then, let's see here, I got, tra oh, and then lastly, research. So if you or any of the people you work with are interested in research, we do even have funds to fly people to San Diego uh, to do brain imaging studies um, and some of our other research. So you can go to our main webpage, which is, why am I blanking on it, eating disorders. This is how you can tell I've been talking for a long time. Um, eating disorders with an S dot UCSD dot edu. And if you want to put your email address in the chat box, um, I can send you guys a note afterwards as well with this information, but you can go to our research page and there's lots and lots of studies that are always going on for binge eating disorder, bulimia, anorexia, for people who are recovered, for people who are still sick, um, and everything in between. And I wanted to acknowledge the research team. So um, while I am a neuroimaging research by training initially, I have not participated in the neuroimaging research here at our center. Um, ever since I've been here, I've been doing other things. So this is our research team. Almost all of them are at the conference right now, and a lot of them are speaking at this conference right now. Um, I would have loved to have some of them with us, but it takes a really big team to do this kind of research, and it's really a collaborative effort, and just so grateful for all the people here. Wonderful. Well, we would love to have all of you back again and again for these. And I will get with you, Erin, on um, making sure that we have enough information up on research participants um, contacting you on Eating Disorder Hope so we can send some folks your way that are looking to participate in that research. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and congrats on your inaugural conference. This is really awesome. Thank you. We were honored to have you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Thank you.